Good morning. Welcome to our second lecture in our public theology series this year. These lectures are in, intended to assist the Garrett Evangelical community in understanding more about the intersection of theological perspectives and values with the needs of the world as we prepare graduates who are equipped to serve and to be concerned about the well-being of all people and creation. This year, the President's Office offers these lectures in honor of the celebration of the 45th anniversary of the Church in the Black Experience. As you know, the events of Ferguson a little over a year ago and beyond, and the continuing violence against the personhood of the bodies of our black brothers and sisters has resulted in the Black Lives Matter movement and a new wave of civil rights in our country. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our lecturer today, another one of our own graduates. <laughs> who has regularly been on the ground leading as a public theologian and activist in Ferguson and beyond. Reverend Dr. Pamela R. Leitze is a 2005 alumna of the PhD program here at Garrett Evangelical. After serving as Dean of Students here at the seminary for a number of years, Dr. Leitze joined the Boston University School of Theology community where she is currently the Associate Dean for Community Life and lifelong learning, and clinical assistant professor of contextual theology and practice. Dr. Leitze is a scholar, social justice activist, and military veteran, whose academic and research interests include classical and contemporary just war theory, womanist theology, queer theory and theology, and African-American religious history and theologies. As an ordained elder in the Northern Illinois Conference of the United Methodist Church, Dr. Leitze pastored an urban church on the south side of Chicago. She has worked with United Methodist general agencies and has strong connections within several mainline denominations. Dr. Leitze has also been a member of the Pan-Methodist Commission for the last two quadrennia. She currently co-chairs the American Academy of Religion's Womanist Approaches to Religion and Society group and recently served on the executive committee for the Soul Repair Project, studying the role of moral injury in veterans under the direction of Dr. Rita Nakashima Brock. Dr. Leitze's publications include Reconciliation in the volume Radical Evangelical and the sermon If There Should Come a Word and Black United Methodist Preach, edited by our own Dr. Jennifer Brooks. Dr. Leitze's latest book, Our Whole Lives Matter, A Womanist Queer Theology, was released on September 18th, 2015. Welcome home, Pamela. We are enjoying the Leitze spirit back in our midst. We look forward to hearing your lecture, Freedom in Blackness, Exploring Theology and Self-Identity in the Midst of Activism, and we are eager to engage you with dialogue following your address. Thank you. Thank you, President Rector, for that introduction and for the invitation to return to Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary to, sh to say a few words, uh, not a few words, a lot of words, let's <laughs> tell the truth, <laughs> to say something about my work in Ferguson in particular, and more broadly speaking, about my work uh, as a public theologian. I, ch I cherish my time at Garrett both as a doctoral student and later as an administrator. And for me, it's just a joy to be here, to be among friends and to be among colleagues, uh, to be among people who mentored me in this work, to be able to give God praise, to talk about the good news, as Jennifer Brooks would say, uh, and to thank God for the ancestral work that's been done by such persons 
as Bishop Ammons, Mr. Clarence, and Reverend Maceo Pembroke. I honor uh, the work that they've done and cherish their ancestral spirits in this place. I want to season the presentation for today by way of a live stream clip that I filmed uh, during the hot summer days of, of last August uh, while working in Ferguson. Uh, much of my work was live streamed. Uh, the resolution is uh, not as good as what, what happened with uh, other cameras because I was working on the ground and using my iPhone. Now I've found that uh, communications professors are teaching students who are interested in journalism to use iPhones in the field when they're doing work such as I, as I was doing. I was very pleased to hear from our communications professor who's using that, that resource in her course uh, at Boston University. So let me share a little bit of, of with, my, with you all about my work. Ryan, so you think we're getting closer to some peace here? I think we, I think we are getting closer to some peace because the community kind of want to simmer things down, you know, kind of like, so the family can have a little peace up until the, yeah, yeah. Of the, the funeral or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. I think that if they don't move a little bit faster with the process of this officer, yeah. things could go, to take that a turn. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and if he's not indicted, you oh, all can oh, 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 oh. God forbid. Okay. It, it's it probably going to be like you know, five. It's going to be back like it was when it first started. Yeah. Really? It's yes. Be yeah. Oh, Lord. You're a bad mess. Oh, Lord. I'm praying for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your prayers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your prayers. I pray for grace and mercy. Yeah. I'm telling you, I just want justice to prevail because at the end of the day, you know, these police more and more every day. Mm -hmm. um, if, when I look at the news, I see more and more these officers being exposed. Yeah. Being exposed for being racist and, and then a lot of times well it's, it's really not about race but then it is about race you know and more and more they're being exposed and it's a shame i can't even believe how this department is covering up trying to cover up this mess and then they didn't just told so many lies and they're right there would lead me to believe you you got something to hide what are you covering mm -hmm. you know, i hear what you're saying but what does justice look like are you thinking you about just what justice look like no yeah. You but what, what, you. Let, me, let me ask you, are you all churchgoers? And if so, what's your pa what are your pastors saying about justice? Well, I haven't been to church in a while. But it doesn't mean I don't believe. Oh, I, I agree. So, I agree. I, mean, I agree. I agree. So, and we got we to gotta, we gotta have hope. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, sis, I, I so appreciate it. So this is the night that the grand jury made the announcement that they wouldn't indict okay, let me Darren get it. Wilson. And I'm down on the streets. I'm trying to see what's going on with our sound. Tear gas. Oh yeah, that burns. Come on, come on, come on. That's white dudes. Tear gas. I mean, that's white dudes. They're burning this shit up all week, man. That ain't fucking us doing that shit. Get a wear off. Oh, shit. 
My work in Ferguson and the current Black Lives Matter movement is part of the continual theological task of innumerable scholars, past and present, coupled with the nettlesome philosophical questions of self-identity. I understand my work as a theological enterprise that features on-the-ground activism as a position for doing theology. It privileges proximity on the ground networking, and often the very rich reflection happening within the movement. The faith seeking is gritty, it is heart pounding, it is the profanity of language seeking to describe the sacredness of our lives. In the position of activists, I'm seeking to comprehend matters of faith while at the same time wrestling with what it means to be black in America and a queer lesbian in black communities. The components or resources of my developing methodology include the usual suspects, reason, experience, scripture, and tradition. But it's also facilitated by social media and cross-disciplinary research. What I hope you see in my work is an engaging, constructive theology that seeks to address matters of our times. On the streets, I'm listening for faith language, whether it be in the exclamation, oh God, as tear gas is being launched, or the woman who kept interjecting, hands up to Jesus, while others were chanting, hands up, don't shoot. I'm asking, what is justice to protest this on Florissant Street, West Florissant Street in Missouri, and capturing who is God in Baltimore, uh, Maryland? Who are God's children in Baltimore, Maryland? I am listening and crying under the sorrowful weight of the pain expressed by my people and the ugliness of racism spewed at those who have the courage to place their bodies in harm's way as they wonder why they are so hated. I would 
hope not. Do you think that Darren, that uh, that uh, Michael Brown has also also been put on trial? Not particularly, no. Uh, given the fact that there was a a moment of silence and honoring Michael Brown, I would say not. What do you think about the video that was released? I think that that was appropriate. I believe that was appropriate. Thank you. We need all. Why, why do you think that was appropriate? Because they're portraying him as a victim, and that's again, that is not right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Why did I shoot my mom? As a black woman, I have no sense that the current accounts of racist attacks are new or increasing. The chokehold video scene of Eric Garner's murder or the undeniably aggressive assault of a 16-year-old child seated at her desk. These things don't happen overnight, friends. Every effort to continue the narrative of, of American exceptionalism has been stitched across the years with the poisonous needle of white supremacy and the thread of the Anglo-Saxon myth as is detailed in my colleague Kelly Brown Douglas's latest book, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. In the context of viral videos depicting racist and often deadly attacks, I and other theologians have looked at blank computer screens trying unsuccessfully to concentrate, to write even a few paragraphs in this publish or perish vocation all the while wrestling with this question of critique. So what does it all mean? This is the question Dr. Reggie Williams asked at last year's Womanist In Gathering during the AAR session. The language we find so insufficient during these times, the language to articulate, to convey intellectual rigor, the language which we have been trained to use cracks under the weight of its own implications. So what does it all mean? Some have asked. What good, what value is our work in light of all of this? I had that question in mind while writing my most recent publication, Our Lives Matter, A Womanist Queer Theology. Though I began writing this book prior to the events of Ferguson, I simply could not imagine publishing it without including some of my own thoughts about my experiences in Ferguson. In the chapter where I deal with the doctrine of creation entitled Co-Creators of a Bountiful Blessing, I wrote these words. Stripped of our dignity through a calculated police strategy of racial profiling and numerous acts of police brutality, public policies derived to cheat black people of their hard-earned income, to deny them proper health care and quality education only incites and escalates situations similar to Ferguson across America and throughout our country's history. The anger against oppression is something we absolutely have to express. It is a wonder it has taken so long to reach a boiling point. When this unexpressed anger finally reaches its limit, it manifests in an explosive anger that to some seems illogical and unreflective. But black people have had ample time to reflect on their suffering. What is not needed are attempts to calm and quiet a people who have uh, berated, maligned, who have been berated, maligned, and who have watched their loved ones killed because they refuse to be regarded as anything less than fully human and fully equal. It is not their anger that ought sh to shock us, but the fallout of human pride that will not see itself as co-caretakers of God's creation. 
not the rage of protesters, but the attempted subjugation of other co-caretakers of God's creation. Unchecked, this will always result in destruction of the earth, of property, and of lives. It is with this unchecked domination and not the unexpressed anger that we must concern ourselves, end quote. I'm hoping that my book helps young activists, black LGBTQ persons, scholars, and other freedom fighters to see the impact of faith upon activism and vice versa. On the streets of Ferguson, Baltimore, and Boston, whether I'm dodging bullets, getting tear gassed, participating in die-ins that ultimately shut the highways down, I am keenly aware of my own privilege as a scholar and my responsibility not just to shut shit down, but to help those who fight for freedom understand the value of their faith, especially the value of the Christian faith to the work of disrupting and eradicating injustice. Therefore, I've understood my work to be that of a public theologian with tasks very similar to how Christian ethicist Max Stackhouse made this argument, uh, made in his argument about public theology. He wrote, it is, and he's speaking about public theology, one in which the motifs of theological discourse, the critical concepts that are basic to the faith are held to be not esoteric. These motifs are not for believers in the sense that you have to be totally on the inside of the faith in order to even understand the vocabulary. Rather, what we are talking about can be discussed with non-believers and believers in other faiths. We can carry on a dialogue, a dispute, an argument, an apology. We can preach in ways and speak in ways that can make sense because there is a certain profound logos that is behind the way you speak of theos. So a theos, logos, the profound coherence of the true divine reality has a certain capacity to communicate if done with care, end quote. The public theologian must be aware of the critical concepts that are basic to the faith, and they must be able to engage them in a way that makes sense to the masses, to the children on the streets. To be effective at this task, the theologian must guard against turning a disinterested eye at the world while eagerly ruminating on the written ruminations of renowned theologians, of dead theologians. This work is theology involved in the world. In my case, it has been involved in my community at times and in spaces, spaces which include the violent urban riot, which Dr. King once spoke of in this way, and I quote, urban riots are special form of violence. They are not insurrections. The rioters are not seeking to seize territory or to attain control of institutions. They are mainly intended to shock the white community. They are a distorted form of social protest. The looting, which is their principal feature, serves many functions. It enables the most enraged and deprived Negro to take hold of consumer goods with the ease the white man does by using his purse. Often, the Negro does not even want what he takes. He wants the experience of taking. But most of all, alienated from society and knowing that the society cherishes property above people, he is shocking it by abusing property rights." End quote. If Dr. King's analysis about riots is correct, if, as he also suggested, a riot is the language of the unheard, 
then ought it not also be one of the functions of the public theologian to hear this language and to translate it to our churches and seminarians, encouraging a response that ministers to and helps usher in liberation and justice for all God's creation. At some point, hearing and watching what was happening in Ferguson just seemed like not enough. Night after night, I watched the news accounts of the unrest in Ferguson. I responded to racist trolls commenting on my social media network, spending way too much time with that foolishness. When national news began to show repeats of earlier stories, I searched the internet for live stream feeds that would provide moment by moment details. I spent hours, I lost sleep. I was up 24 hours uh, some days without going to sleep. During the day, I kept my computer windows open to Twitter posts. In my office, yes, I, I admit, I, I watched Twitter and I, you know, I looked at live stream during the day in my office. And, and I listened to the voices of news commentators broadcasting through other computer windows. On my bookshelf in my office, I stared at Frantz Fanon's book, remembering his words. We revolt simply we revolt simply because for so many reasons, we can no longer breathe. I stayed in this day's existence until finally, when the governor of Missouri declared a state of emergency and called in the National Guard, Guards. That was the moment that beckoned my participation in the movement. As a black parent, as a military veteran, as clergy, as one whose dissertation on just war question the historic use of government sanctioned force against black bodies. And oddly enough, as one who had over the course of that year created a robust live stream a program for the School of Theology, I was ready, or equipped as we say in seminaries. <laughs> and as the motivational speaker Les Brown used to proclaim, Perhaps he still exclaims this, I was hungry. So I share this with you, friends, because uh, the balance of what I have to say about my work makes no sense without this context. I, I mean, why the hell does a 50-plus-year-old woman with asthma leave her office at a major research institution to travel to a community being patrolled by militarized police who are using rubber bullets and tear gas? It makes no sense. As a child of the black power movement, as a scholar participating in the movement, it makes all the sense in the world. Okay. And, and I'm convinced now more than ever that there, that there are particular things that we all glean from the experiences, from the words of the protesters, from the experiences of those who are on the ground. And I want to share those with you. One, America's insistence on lifting up and suspending the theological work of Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent campaign while ignoring the theology of the black power movement lends to its inability and unwillingness to accept the radicalness and the truth of the Black Lives Matter movement. We shall overcome is on repeat played over and over again through our theological headsets, while what is actually being sang all around us is this.
right, I think you get my point here. Theological freedom is the courage to hear as much as it is the absence of constraint. And what young activists are saying is, we understand, we, we have the hope that we shall overcome. But now, now we are reaching and we are grasping the language of the black power, the, at least the tenor of the black power movement, and saying to our oppressors, what the hell are you talking about? You tell us to be quiet, you tell us to wait, you tell us that freedom will come, you tell us that liberation will come one day, you tell us that this is justice, and our response is, hell, you talking about? What this has meant for my work is liberation to view uh, my work on the streets as incredibly important to the courses I teach in the academy. I'm not interested in kumbaya sessions to assuage white students who have bought into the hour that only dead white men's thoughts are valid, nor am I coddling students of color for fear of being known as the sister who won't give a sister or a brother a break. <laughs> black bodies are being attacked daily, and young black activists who have never set foot in schools of theology have suckled from the theology of black liberation theologian James Cone, from black philosophers like Frantz Fanon and Cornel West, from the words of writers like James Baldwin, and from the activism of Fred Hampton, Angela Davis, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and yes, Asada Shakur. In fact, Asada Shakur's words, it is my duty to fight for our freedom. It is my duty uh, to win. We must love and support each other. Uh, we have nothing to lose but our chains is one of the anthems of social justice activists. It is, in translation, our duty to fight for our freedom as theologians. Secondly, young activists, like many of our students, are seeking a way to make sense out of traditions of faith that have shaped their lives. What can the message of Jesus mean within this movement that is largely interfaith? Framed by that signature text, love thy neighbor as thyself, it does have impact. But to hear this message, the world as pulpit must include its place on the streets with its clergy and scholars as translators of our doctrines into the everyday language, the dialect of the masses. Umi Selah, also known as Philip Agnew, who is the executive director of Dream Defenders, has challenged the church and said that Ferguson will determine whether or not the church is still relevant. I think that if the leadership of the church is complicit in maintaining racism, Ferguson challenges, it challenges that and ought therefore be, and, and those who uh, maintain silence ought to be given several seats on the sidelines of life. Thirdly, this raw honesty and explicit disdain for injustice is being articulated in the leaderful groups of young activists all across America. And it scares the hell out of a lot of liberals and progressives. Why? Because the paradigm has shifted such that the young people will not, absolutely will not, be stymied by demands of respectability. They refuse to believe that saying no to the intentional absence of agendas and teachings that promote black liber liberation is somehow wrong. They refuse to be told that black history and, and theology and, and the scholars of black theologians ought to be uh, recommended rather than required learning. They understand that obedience and peace are often acts of violence demanded by the status quo. For instance, when after their recent disruption of Hillary Clinton's speech at the Atlanta University Center, someone sought to chastise them by saying, black lives matter, but this is not the time. 
The protesters turned and looked at them with all deliberation as if to say, bruh. <laughs> Participating in the movement for black lives has shown me the intentionality with which this generation of activists also regard the intersections of oppression. In my book, Our Lives Matter, I speak about the leadership of black lesbians, queer, and transgender persons. I have watched K.B. Frazier, who's pictured on, your, on the right, uh, a leading black Jewish trans activist. I watched her shut down a brother on the streets in front of the Ferguson Police Department who had the audacity to insult the lives and the work of black LGBTQ persons. I tell you, her shutdown was a thing of beauty. <laughs> she took him to school, and the only tuition he had to pay was being openly shamed in front of other activists. <laughs> My work, my work has also made it quite clear to me that if seminaries are to do the work of preparing leaders for the world, then we must teach in such ways that our students understand that there can be no divide between the church, the academy, and our local communities. No divide. To that end, this summer, I and about 200 uh, scholars, uh, black scholars and allies gathered in Ferguson at the Center for Social Empowerment and Justice, a ministry of Wellspring United Methodist Church, to think about the impact of our work in light of the continuing attacks against black bodies. Garrett, I'm proud to say, sponsor, was one of the sponsors for that event, and Dr. Stephen Ray helped, uh, was very helpful in, in helping to shape and to coordinate the event, and he served as one of our leading scholars and, and after the event helped write the statement about, the theological statement of black lives, and we, we, we need to give him thanks for that. I've also had the privilege of bringing some of the leading Black Lives Matter, Matter activists with whom I worked in Ferguson and in other places to Boston University. Uh, this work is not simply a work that's on the ground in the field, but it's also a work that our students are hungry to hear about and to learn about in our classrooms. As a matter of fact, the class that I'm teaching right now, uh, we actually had to, to, to limit the number of students that wanted to, to sit in this seminar because so many students want to participate in the class that I'm teaching called Spirituality and Social Justice Activism in African American Traditions. Finally, finally, the worth of doing theology in specific contexts is the hard work the theologian must do to be aware of their own privilege. I made the, the assumption on my first trip to Ferguson that my skin color afforded me a certain insider knowledge and way of being. In reality, the privilege of class, to, to include education, without the benefit of collaborative relationships relegated me uh, to the status of outsider, insider. To do the work, I had to develop relationships across class, across genders, across sexual identities, ethnicities, races, faith, vocations, geographic locations, and age groups. I also had to recognize that my freedom to do the work has only come because I decided to accept the beauty of my blackness and the wonder of my sexuality. This has meant establishing one clear boundary for the academy and the church. And that boundary for me is that I will not allow uh, either, I, that I will allow neither of the academy, neither the academy or the church to make me deny the value of my work and the sacred worth of my people. Neither one of them. <laughs> Setting that boundary has freed me to speak truth and to do work, 
to do ministry, to do ministry even that the church declares is in violation in terms of my United Methodist Church, to do work that the church declares is in violation of his book of discipline. I'm free from that. I grew up poor. If I lose a job, I know how to be poor. I'm free. I'm free to do the work. And that's really valuable if you're going to be a public theologian. You cannot be constrained by the thought or the idea or the fear that you might lose your job or that someone will not accept you or someone will be uh, less appreciative of your work. Uh, as the young activists proclaim, you got to stay woke and you got to do the work. And that's, my, and that's what I stand on as I continue to do the work of a public theologian. I appreciate your kind reception of my reflections, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leitze, for a prophetic and provocative word. We expected no less. Um, let's take about 10 minutes or so for some questions. We have uh, roaming microphones available. So comments, questions? Be not shy. Yeah. Dr. Bedford and then Dr. Ray. Tell us more about what you want to do next. That's a good question. <laughs> and I say it's a good question because um, I never imagined that I would be doing the work that I'm doing uh, as a public theologian in the field. I didn't imagine that. Um, but I'm, I'm thankful that for whatever reasons, the ancestors' uh, protection and the leading of the Holy Spirit, I w I've been prepared. So I imagine my work will continue to be work that's rich in, in communities, uh, largely black communities and the LGBTQ communities. I imagine my work will continue to shock the hell out of the church. Um, and that, that I will continue to do radical uh, theology. Uh, I hope at some point in time I get to retire. <laughs> uh, but for right now, uh, my, 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 my woman is the Black, Power, Black Lives Matter movement. I'm deeply committed to that movement. Uh, and it doesn't seem as though uh, there, is, there will be any lessening of things that, that I will speak to. Each day we have some event uh, that calls our attention to the need for the continued work. So I imagine that I'll have my hands full with doing that over the course of time. I'm going to continue to teach courses. Um, um, this year I've learned um, in a real, I mean a real, real good way that what I have to say as a womanist theologian uh, is not secondary to what someone what Karl Barth had to say. It's not, it's not secondary to any of these uh, theologians. So I'll continue to, to do my work and to, uh, uh, to make, to lift up uh, the experiences of black folk and to see them and to call them as primary uh, in, my, in my scholarship. Oh, okay, very good. So thank you, Dr. Lightsey. Thank you, Pamela. Now, I don't have a question. I'm getting ready to uh, do something outrageous, if you don't mind. Oh, I love outrageous. Right? I mean, one of the things I want to do is I want people to understand that Garrett really is in the house in some significant ways. I happened to glance over my shoulder and saw, you know, just a clump of people over here who I know are woke. Yes. I teach yes. them. So I'm going to ask one of them, whoever feels moved by the Spirit, what I've, 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 yes. I've, 
I've seen you doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I believe you're a professor as well. Um, how do you take your public theology into the classroom and then encourage your students to take it out? Yeah, that's a good, very good, very good question. How do I take it into the classroom? Uh, I'm teaching. I mean, the class that I'm teaching right now, the spirituality and social justice activism, I bring in I, I, either through Skype or visits some of my activist friends and, and persons from other faiths to talk about how faith influences activism. I really want students to understand that activism is not happening in a vacuum, but that there is a, there, there's a religious implication to what and a theological implication to what is happening. That is not to say that all the activists understand it as such. But for me, the matter of justice is a theological matter. And, and so I'm trying to teach that to our students by asking questions like, you know, asking them to struggle with the response, I'm spiritual but not religious, which is, is in, in and of itself a critique of the church. And asking them to, to, to think about uh, their own, how they practice their faith and how the practice of their faith might actually be complicit in the oppression of black people and people or how the practice of their faith actually supports the liberation of persons. So I'm doing that within the classroom. So, um, dream. I want you to close your eyes and dream big. Thank you, Genesis. We're in the process of looking at our curriculum and um, trying to stretch ourselves, I think. I'm not on the committee, but I guess that's what we're trying to do. If you could dream that you could put something into Garrett Evangelical, but in every seminary, every Christian seminary, to help those of us who don't have feet to the ground in Ferguson or in New York or in Baltimore, what would you, what would that be? What would you say to every single seminary, dream big, this is what you need to put into your curriculum in order to expand the minds of those who come into your space? And money is not an issue. And money is, not, that's why I said dream. I just want to be clear. Dream big, dream big. I want to be clear dream with big. that. So if, if money were not an issue, I would insist that every seminary have within it, not just courses, but that there is a, um, every semester that the seminary brings in key organic intellectuals uh, who, who are helping to shape uh, the course of our nation and our world, who may or may not see their work as theological, but we understand it to be very profound work. I, I would insist that every student sit under the feet of these kinds of organic intellectuals and, and regard them as experts in the field. I don't think we do enough of that. I think we regard uh, those who have written 10, 15 books as experts in the field. And I've learned from my field work that there's a lot of brilliance uh, that is written on the pages of the streets. And I would, insist that, I would insist that that happen. That would be one component. Another component is I would, if, if we were dreaming big, I would insist that every, every year uh, scholars, the faculty persons, are given sufficient funds to, um, to study the current uh, activism that's taking place in connection with the, the public policy that's being shaped in local communities. I think one thing that I've learned in Boston is that public policy is happening and we are in the sem seminary and, and at the university are doing something else. And it's only when our local communities call universities to task and say, hey, you're in our community, but we don't know anything about what you're doing, that we begin to scramble. The last thing I would do is I would dismiss all this marketing about diversity. I would just dismiss it because it's really, it's really just that marketing. 
uh, until, until the seminary could really, sh I mean, put a mirror, allow itself to, to have a mirror, and to hear from activists to say, okay, really, are, are we really doing the work? I, I wouldn't make the claim of, I wouldn't make the claim of diversity anymore. Thank you, Dr. Lightsey. Um, I too have found myself in that 50, ish area. But and we look good now. Amen. <laughs> and so I've had to come to peace with the fact that I'm not a young giant anymore. I've, I've moved over into that area of elder. And um, Dr. Ray has talked with some of us along this lines, and I'd love to hear your comments as well. What is your instruction to us as elders as we are nurturing and fostering, uh, speaking to and observing this new civil rights movement? I would encourage the elders to do the latter first, to observe rather than the former, and that is speak to. Uh, young activists know when they're being spoken to rather than when they're being heard. So I would encourage those of us who are elders to listen to what the act is and to appreciate it, to really appreciate it. Uh, the problem that I see going on, uh, which some people are calling a generational gap between the Black Lives Matter activists and uh, those of what some call the old vanguard, is really a matter of being able to make the shift to appreciate new methodology, new ways of responding to racism, uh, new ways of responding to oppression. Uh, the inability to hear it um, and to appreciate the newness is problematic because it means you hold on. You hold on to days of old when we did it this way. You, you hold on to uh, who ought to be regarded highly. And as much as I, I, I respect uh, um, the work of someone like John Lewis, simply because he is John Lewis does not mean he will be respected and lifted high uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, it, it is more than what one did yesterday, uh, but what one is continuing to do. Now, he is highly regarded. I use him as, as an example because there are others who are still riding on the wings of what they did in the 60s. And you know, we, we, they're riding on the wings of that, and the young people are on jets. <laughs> you know? And we can't quite, we haven't quite figured that out. Is that helpful? I have, um, I have two questions for you. Um, the first, Oh, it was on. <laughs> the first question is, um, we are starting a student organization called Seminarians for Justice, where we're um, connecting with the Lutheran Theological Seminaries and others. And so I was wondering, um, do you have any suggestions working interfaith and working with other groups as to how to support or lend to the cause rather and listen rather than lead? Um, and then the other question that I have, just, just out of the sake of curiosity, do you have a favorite um, song that you like to sing in protest? I love Hell You Talking About. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. new. I mean, can't you, you just, if you know me, you know why I like it. You know, it's just really, it's, it's nice. It's nice. I love it. It's radical enough. Uh, to the first, the group that you're speaking about, I don't know enough about the context of your group I, to, to to determine how you might go about that. Um, we've been having some conversations about the word allies, and that is becoming a word that's, that's being critiqued. Uh, much rather use the term freedom, freedom fighters than allies, because allies move in and move out at their will when it's, when it's comfortable for them. You know, Freedom fighters, they put themselves on the line. Okay, and that's the distinction that we're making. Now, I, you know, this is language, so some lang sometimes language fails, and allies is good, uh, but really the heart, the thought is freedom fighters, okay? 
Uh, and I would just suggest you, you, you all go back and look at, now this is where history is good, that you look at the history of the freedom fighters. You become aware of that history. If nothing, I mean, one of the moments that hurt me most when I was in Ferguson last year was standing on the steps of old courthouse uh, with hundreds of protesters, a good number of white allies. Uh, we were on the steps of old court in St. Louis. And the name Dred Scott came up. And white allies were asking, who is that? Okay, uh, and I and I, I you know I won't call you all out because some of you don't know who Dred Scott is. Okay, which which told me there is a lot of passion for protest, but there's still not enough education. Okay, and I I insist that you all that 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 you do the work. The young activists they're doing and there uh, many of them have are not in seminary. They do the work to read and to, to know, I mean, it's a lot of information that they understand. But there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Please understand the history, uh, particularly if you're going to work in Black Lives Matter movement, take it upon yourself to get to know some of the rich history of the civil rights movement, some of the history of black, black people living in America. One of the most embarrassing moments uh, that I saw happening to a, a young white activist is when he stood on the street on Canefield Street trying to tell an elderly black man about his history. You could have seen his body being sliced to pieces as this black man just, just, just began to just give him, tell him stuff that he arrogantly thought he knew get to understand the history. I think that's important. And let me invite all of you over to lunch at uh, Loader Hall, back down the outside door, back door here on the first floor over. Uh, get your lunch and we'll be in the side dining room uh, with Dr. Lightsey. Uh, Dr. Lightsey, good to see you again. Good to be seen by you, Nicholas. <laughs> Uh, well, we had a community organizing conference on the south side of Chicago uh, in September uh, called Visionary Care on Black Mental Health. Uh, Dr. Trina Armstrong was one of the presenters um, and led a session on trauma and post-trauma in the black community. Um, she mentioned that uh, the Black Lives Matters movement leaders in Minnesota came to her because they were emotionally messed up uh, being on the, on the cutting edge of activism. Uh, so my question is, from your perspective, how do we begin to um, engage the emotional trauma of black people as part of the, the fight for justice. Well, I think we, you know, I think uh, your question kind of answers it, and that is the responsibility of those of us who have unique gifts and skills to commit ourselves to the work of working within the movement. I said last year quite a few times, that I wish, uh, that I ha hope to see more black psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, pastoral uh, care, psychotherapists on the ground. Because uh, there was a lot of stuff happening. I myself, when I got back uh, the first, the second trip uh, to, Fer to Ferguson, um, went and sought uh, help. I had to sit on the couch because I was just traumatized. Uh, it is too much. Um, and I tend to believe that black America, and America, broadly speaking, those who care, those who give a damn, are experiencing trauma with the constant videos, the constant news uh, reports about uh, the excessive force being used against black bodies. I, I believe that, and I, so I think that, there, that the work of uh, those who are in those fields is going to be quite helpful. Also, clergy persons. Uh, I can't say enough about the need for the church to be on the streets. I said that in my presentation. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been, I found some hope in seeing some clergy on the streets. Uh, 
there's some criticism about uh, clergy who uh, have allowed or who have unwittingly been used as, uh, so as, as, as mechanisms for the state in keeping peace in the ranks. There's been some criticism about that, so I would say, uh, you know, one ought to be careful of, of, of how one is, you know, comporting themselves within the movement as clergy person and as a scholar, because it's easy to be used. You know, it's quite easy to be used. Uh, but I think we ought to be there. I, I have critiqued my own uh, denomination for, um, for its, um, its lack. I mean, we, we have thousands of clergy. Uh, for me to be in Ferguson and um, a handful of other, uh, just a handful, and most notably Willis Johnson on the streets in Ferguson, um, to be leading that work, it, it's, it's, that's a large, that's a load. That's, that's a lot for clergy on the streets without the total, I mean, to, without being able to look around and, and see other clergy in mass lock arms with you? What would it have looked like if during those early days in Ferguson, our council of bishops had booked a trip to Ferguson and just locked arms and committed themselves? That didn't happen. You know why that didn't happen? Because they were still trying to figure out who was right and who was wrong. That was the small picture. The larger picture was this was a community that had been attacked by racism for decades. And so I wrote about that, you know, and I critiqued the church because the larger, the larger picture is systemic racism. And to that larger picture, the church ought to be in mass addressing that. And so I want to see that, that kind of courage from scholars, that kind of courage from clergy persons. And um, if someone asks me what I see myself doing in the future, in most immediate future, I'll be, I'll be, having an, I'll be writing another uh, statement about um, my, the silence, the silence of the church, the silence of the church. And, I, you know, we speak out. I, I probably should be a little gentler with the church. There have been some who have, no? There have been some who have spoken out. But I want to see, at least in my, in, my, in my denomination, I want to see our council of bishops really put themselves to the task of issuing more pastoral letters that address systemic racism and, and address the trauma, <laughs> that, address the, that address the trauma. I want to see us doing that. And I'm, a, I'm an out queer lesbian person. I think we've written more, there have been more pastoral letters that have come from our council of bishops about human sexuality than has come about systemic racism. And I find that problematic. Now, I, you didn't ask for all of that. It didn't cost you anything but time. Thank you. <laughs>